Okay, so it's my pleasure today to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Ale Faris. He is a uh, professor and endowed chair at Prairie View a &M. Uh, he received his bachelor's, uh, I'm sorry, he received his bachelor's from Tunisia, which is where he's from. Uh, and in my, of course, American ignorance, uh, I need to point out that uh, that is neither where the uh, flood nor the fire took place, but very close to both of them. Um, he did his PhD and his master's at the University of Florida, uh, where he actually minored in his master's in computer science, found out. Um, and the way I've gotten to know Ali was through uh, Benayak Mohanty's AI and Agriculture Project. Uh, Ali is really pushing the, the boundaries and, and pushing the uh, frontiers of application of data science, especially in modeling, uh, as it relates to soil and water and, and the, the nexus of those things with food. Um, so we're really pleased to be able to bring him up here. We always hope to have better collaborations with Prairie View A&M. And um, I know he already is collaborating with a number of the, the people here at Texas A&M University, good friend of uh, agriculture and agri-life. So uh, Dr. Ferris, anything else you want me to cover? You did I mean, I could, there's so many pages of like awards and you know <laughs> hundreds of millions of PI, co PI, editor of four books, National Mission of Water Security, fifth national climate assessment. That's a big deal. Thank you. It's just too much. He's Thank a fellow of multiple societies. Uh, please welcome Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. I really appreciate it uh, for uh, the hospitality that uh, you uh, and other colleagues uh, showered me with uh, during my. Uh, a few hours. <laughs> uh, this is uh, second home to me. Uh, Prairie View is only 40 minutes away, and uh, I'm uh, delighted to see uh, great colleagues like uh, Dr. Hansa Morano and Dr. Mohtar Rabi Matar and uh, others who really took the time and, and uh, from their busy schedule and, and made sure to come and uh, uh, have lunch. Also, the, the colleagues who had lunch with me early today, uh, I've liked them, especially. Uh, uh, Associate uh, Batfield for Research, Dr. Henry Fedemero, and uh, also uh, uh, Julie and uh, uh, Natia. So I think that that was a, a very kind of you. It's my pleasure to be here. So I'm going today to talk to you about smart technology uh, and also approaches uh, as, as it relates to food, water, uh, and energy security. Uh, this is a little bit different from maybe uh, some of the talks you had in, in data sciences before, but this is also, uh, I, I was talking, joking with uh, Seth and I was at the University of Florida doing a minor in computer science and people asked me, what's your major? I said, agronomy. I said, computer science, what do you do with computer science? I said, there are plenty of good, good things that you can do with, with computer <laughs> agriculture in general. So. Uh, but uh, uh, so, so hopefully today we're gonna share with you some of the work that we have been doing, uh, mainly a couple of projects, but uh, uh, we have several projects with uh, colleagues here at uh, Texas A&M that are covering uh, a, a lot of data and uh, are data uh, centric. Uh, this work that I'm gonna be presenting is not my only work by uh, my colleagues and I would like to recognize the team that uh, are in charge of this or helping me with this. So this is uh, one of our field and uh, took a picture of the, through our drones to this show the, 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 the team. So this is an undergraduate uh, student, a postdoc, uh, a research scientist, another <laughs> fellow colleague who's a, a professor in, in our department and, uh, and so on. So um, the couple of projects that I'm going to talk about here how much time do I have? Yeah, about 50 minutes. Okay, so uh, uh, Climate Smart Agriculture and AI in Agriculture. So two projects that are funded through USDA NIFA. One is from late, uh, uh, and uh, 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 to be correct, the second one is also partially funded by uh, AgriLife uh, uh, Research. It's formulating soil amendment practices using smart agriculture technologies and uh, uh, machine learning uh, approaches. The second one will be about uh, integrated AI uh, approaches combined with the power of emerging technologies to detect, identify, and quantify various types of crop and ecosystem stresses. And basically we're gonna focus, we're focusing on two uh, stress, water stress and nutrient stress. Um, and the second project we're uh, collaborating with University of Minnesota, uh, David Mola in the area of AI uh, 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 on that project. So 
Climate smart agriculture uh, is a principal contributor, to, uh, I'm sorry, agriculture is a principal contributor to greenhouse gases emission and consequently uh, global warming. We, uh, in agriculture, we make up up to 15% of the global anthropogenic emissions, according to some statistics. So climate smart agriculture is a strategy uh, to address the challenges of climate change and food security through sustainable agriculture production. How can we sustain production of agriculture? How can we secure food and protect our water resources uh, without compromising our environment, without compromising the quality of life that we live in, which is a challenge uh, 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 task. So climate smart agriculture has three pillars. Uh, the first one is uh, sustainable, uh, sustainably increase agricultural productivity and income. So can we do those together? Uh, second is uh, adapt and build the resilience of people and food system to climate change. Because as you have noticed this summer, I mean, uh, he was mentioning about you have an earthquake in Morocco and a, a flood, devastating flood in uh, uh, Libya. And if you look at the uh, last uh, first 15 days in, in September, there are floods in Spain, there are floods everywhere, there are it's disasters or, 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 or after disaster all over the globe. So how can we sustain an agricultural production system? How can we sustain sustainable life in these challenging times? Uh, reduce or, uh, and or remove greenhouse gas emission where possible. So, <clears throat> and that's where we need to use new practices, where we use practices that are really uh, can uh, achieve, uh, help us achieve uh, food security, help us achieve water security, but without compromising uh, uh, our environment. So uh, the first project that I'm going to talk about, formulating soil amendment practices using uh, sustainable agriculture technologies and AI approaches. Uh, this uh, projects we have uh, several objectives. The main of them is to investigate the effect of soil amendment types, which basically for this case, uh, the chicken and dairy manures and also by chart uh, and rates uh, on soil physical, chemical, biological properties, also on the soil uh, CO2 emission and other uh, greenhouse gases emission. Uh, and carbon sequestration. Uh, also, the effect of these treatments on soil water nutrient uh, availability or dynamics within the root zone available for the plants and below the root zone. Uh, also, the effect of these treatments on crop growth performance, yield, biomass, uh, through uh, in-situ uh, and remotely sensed uh, sensors. So using SPAD meters or using uh, uh, radar uh, or using satellite imagery or uh, uh, mounted on a, a, a drone. So we did this experiment twice. We did it in 2000. And, uh, in fact, we did several years, but on, uh, the ones that I'm talking about, we had this experiment last year, 2022, and this year. In 2022, we used sweet corn. So you see, this is sweet corn, but that sweet corn was too sweet for the raccoons. So when the crop was ready, we go in the morning and we find like there has a party there. I mean, is it, <laughs> uh, corns are everywhere. So uh, uh, we got what we got from that experiment. We couldn't get the yield, but we got other, uh, the, all the other components. So we decided next year we're going to go for a different crop. So we said that maybe sorghum could be the answer. And it looks like it is the answer because we didn't have any uh, raccoon damage this, this season. So this is the uh, experimental design that you can see for experimental one that I'm going to talk about here. And you have three replicates. And we have, as you mentioned, we have a, a, a biochar two levels and a, a chicken and dairy manure three levels compared to the control, no, no uh, application of manure. So you can even see from, from this that some treatments are different from others. So these are some of the treatments that I would like to. So this is a, a, a dairy manure double the rate, which is the, double the recommended rate. So for the rates, we have zero or half of the recommended rate, the recommended rate, and double the recommended rate. 
So for this case, you'll see that this is the dairy manure. The first one here in, in the middle in front of me is dairy manure, uh, double the rate and biochar uh, single rate. This is uh, uh, just double the manure, uh, double the biochar rates, right? And so on. So like this one, for example, you see it's a double the manure rate and double the biochar rate. And you can see here this poorly performing that's control. So from this, from the get go, that do we have an effect of these treatment types and and and, uh, and rates? I think you can see that there is uh, 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 there is an effect, right? So uh, so let's go and we will talk to you about the results in detail later. So this is, as I mentioned, uh, to um, uh, okay. I'm going backwards. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to uh, show you a video, uh, a two clip, two minute clip vid video clip. Well, it would be great if, if we can. Uh... Can you start with the bottom? Hmm? At the bottom, it's the start button. Oh, oh. Oh, I got um... the style. Let's start, right? Go a little bit wrong. Keep going. All the way to the bottom. I was hoping to try it before, but I'm <laughs> sorry. I think it doesn't. We'll, 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 we'll come to it later, okay? We'll. we'll uh, uh, why is it not? Okay, so let's 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 keep moving. This part is okay. So uh, uh, the instrumentation, the experimental instrumentation. You see, this is the. I'm sure you're familiar with weather station. This is the air and soil temperature measurements. This is a soil washer sense uh, a data logger. We measuring. The soil moisture sensor within the root zone, below the root zone at 15, top 15 centimeters and lower 30 centimeters. This colored green here, uh, uh, color, the green color here, it's for CO2 measurement. So we put it, the CO2 uh, instrument there to measure the soil moisture, uh, the CO2 emission. Uh, okay. Uh, we also, this is uh, basically downloading the soil moisture, CO2 measurements. Uh, this is SPAD meter reading, so they were measuring the chlorophyll level of the plants. Uh, this is the NDVI uh, instrument measuring the NDVI value for the crops. Uh, we also did some uh, soil physical properties like hydroconductivity measurement, or biomass yeah. harvesting measurement, and soil water solution sampling in the road zone and below the road zone to determine the composition of the uh, soil solution there as a, as a function of the treatments. Uh, so this is uh, 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 basically based uh, a photo of, of the with drone of the these treatments that are chicken based. So you can see this is the zero control. This is biochar only. This is by uh, chicken recommended rate uh, plus biochar uh, at one at rate level one, and this is the double recommended rate of chicken and the biochar. So you can see there is difference and the performance just visually without any image analysis uh, of, of the data. Uh, so uh, we're gonna talk about the impact of soil amendment on vegetation indices, NDVI, chlorophyll content, and biomass. So these are the instruments we used uh, to determine uh, the NDVI values, and the other one is to uh, determine the chlorophyll readings. Uh, we did an ANOVA statistical analysis of, of, of these measurements. We took NDVI and SPAD meter measurement throughout the growing season. So these, uh, and we did an analysis of, of those data. And you can see that uh, it tells us based on the p-value that uh, the menu type rates and by chart, they all statistic, they have a statistically significant effect on the value. So the meter responded to the differences in the uh, uh, of the readings that they are making. So there are some interaction between the two. 
But this is a good indicator, at least, at, at, uh, that this meter responds to the traits and, and, and types. So that means you can detect or you can quantify, at least through it, what, uh, uh, what you want to quantify, which is chlorophyll level and all, all of a sudden uh, health indices. So based on that ANOVA, we did some mean separation. And you can see that uh, statistically, the double recommended rate is statistically different from all the other treatments. And the recommended rate is different, and the control is different. So you can see clearly that, uh, that that's the effect. So the higher the recommend, the higher the value of the NDVI, the healthier the plant is because the NDVI is from minus one to plus one. So the closer to one you are, the uh, that the greener the better are your uh, uh, plant's health. The same thing for the menu rates. You can see that. You, you put more manures, okay, the, and basically the plants are greener, better, healthier, so that's a good uh, uh, estimate of the two. So uh, we did the effect of the biochar. Uh, so uh, SPAD meter reading, again, if you uh, put more biochar, the uh, NDVI and the SPAD meter reading are better. So what uh, biochar, as you know, it's... Uh, Mostly inert, doesn't contribute with, with nutrients, but it improves the water holding capacity of the soil. It Im improves the, the, the porosity of the soil, it improves uh, the physical property of, of the soil. So that means adding biochar helps improve the retention of the water and also retention of the nutrients availability for the plants. Uh, so we did a correlation between biomass and SPAD meter. And that's the relationship between, for this is for chicken manure, and this is uh, the silking stage of, of the of sweet corn. You can see the uh, uh, great relationship between the uh, biomass and, and span meter, which means if you calibrate this sensor for sweet corn and you do it through uh, several data and then later on, based on the reading of the span meter reading that you can, uh, collect in the field, you can predict the type of, of biomass that you can have on from a particular treatment or a crop. And had we had the uh, yield data, we would uh, expect that we could have a similar, uh, hopefully, relationship. So that help us predict. And that's how, for example, uh, 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 the USDA uh, uses satellite imagery to predict yield across the country for different crops and also can do it also uh, across the globe as well. Satellite-based uh, uh, imagery. So the same thing for dairy, you have a relatively uh, high correlation of 0 0.77. Uh, for um, this is a silken stage, milken stage, less, uh, uh, the strength is not as, as strong. So um, the next uh, uh, component of, of this work, we're gonna be talking about uh, impact of soil amendments on soil CO2 emissions. So we did uh, collect the soil uh, CO2 emission from those colored throughout the growing season. So we do it uh, on a weekly basis. So uh, we take the soil uh, CO2 measurement uh, on all the treatments. We were planning on taking also other gases, but unfortunately, uh, the, the instrument didn't come on time uh, to, to do that. So hopefully, we will do it uh, uh, next growing season. But uh, this one shows us, again, the p-value that uh, uh, there is a strongly, uh, uh, strong effect of the soil types and rate, uh, significant effect. Also, as far as there is a, a, a correlation between uh, types and rates, and also between uh, uh, amendment types of biochar and biochar uh, 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 rates as well. So uh, three-way uh, interactions as well. So we did mean separation uh, of the effect of the uh, amendment rate and amendment types. And you can see here that uh, the chicken manure statistically had higher CO2 emission than the dairy manure. And uh, also the uh, between the recommended and uh, control and double recommended, the double recommended rate had more CO2 
uh, statistically uh, higher CO2 emission than the other two treatments. Uh, based on those individually weekly uh, uh, collection of CO2, we did the cumulative. We cumulated uh, the cumulative rates of CO2 emission uh, and, uh, throughout the growing season. And you can see uh, uh, chicken, double chicken manure, double uh, biochar is leading the way of higher CO2 emission from uh, uh, from the, 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 uh, this experiment, you have some. Uh, uh, what intrigues me, we're trying to understand the control. For example, in the beginning, it was the lowest. Then somehow, during the middle of the season, becomes a little bit higher than other of the treatments. We're trying to understand through the soil uh, 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 analysis of the soil, so that we can know maybe there is. Uh, inherently higher uh, maybe organic amendment on those types on those treatments than uh, in others so we, we're trying to understand that uh, relationship why that happened so the same thing for um, uh, okay so this is uh, this is basically for the double biochar with different menu rates this is the one biochar level for uh, different menu rates and you can see again the chicken is leading the way, and the dairy uh, 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 the least. Uh, so uh, uh, the higher the rate of the chicken, so the ch chicken is really double rate are, are uh, leading the way on CO two emission compared to the other treatments. Uh, we did uh, different pie char rates. So here, for example, the control uh, by char. Uh, it's amazing that the control has a higher CO two emission than the other uh, the biochar level. So it looks like biochar is uh, storing some of the uh, uh, composition of those minerals, so preventing them, fighting them from being uh, uh, biodegraded by the microbes so that they can be uh, basically decomposed uh, as a CO2. We're trying to understand what, what does that mean physically uh, and, and how is the process is going. But it's interesting to see that, uh, especially in the last part of the growing season, you have the control is uh, overcoming uh, the other two treatments. Uh, uh, through this data, we're trying to examine, is the CO2 emission constant throughout the growing season, or does it, there is a trend, it doesn't increase, does it decrease, what is the fate of the, of the CO2 emission to the soil? And we did a trend analysis. So this is show that, for example, for this case, which is chicken manure at the recommended rate and uh, biochar at rate one, uh, the p-value is not, there is a, a, a trend of decrease trend with this uh, level of, of uh, 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 slope, but it's not statistically significant at the 5% level, it's higher. But at the other two, two the other treatments, the p-value is less than 5%, and there is this trend of, of decreasing uh, of CO2 emission as a function of the treatments. As you can see here, uh, it's uh, the rate of decrease uh, is can be uh, as 0 0.58 or 0 0.59, uh, and those two treatments. So that means CO2 emission throughout the growing season is not constant. It decreases. And if you think about it, you have a larger biomass in the beginning, right? As you, uh, these biomass decompose and the microbes chew on them and chemical reactions. So the, the storage rate becomes less and less. That's one, maybe one of the explanation for uh, this decrease and the rate of the uh, of uh, similar trends we saw it in, in, in the other uh, basically uh, treatment except this one uh, for this is for dairy manure basically uh, we we sh we saw a similar trend but what you can notice is the the the, the slope or the rate of decrease is a slower some um, but it's sometimes it's comparable to the chicken to what you saw the chicken uh, manure decomposition rate. So we did also uh, 
correlation, uh, uh, computed correlation used uh, Pearson methods with the uh, listwise deletion. So this is to uh, establish the relationship between CO2 emissions, soil moisture, and weather parameters. So, uh, what, uh, so what uh, you can see from this that the CO2 uh, is strongly correlated with the soil moisture. The higher the soil moisture, the higher the uh, uh, CO2 emission. Uh, with the temperature, is the relationship is negatively correlated. Uh, uh, with um, okay, so with the humidity as well, with relative humidity, uh, so you, you can see that's a, a different uh, uh, relationship between uh, CO2 emission and soil motion and other weather parameters, soil radiation, relative humidity, and temperature. Okay, so the same thing, this is for, uh, uh, yeah, so the same data. So we did also, um, since there is this relationship between soil moisture and CO2 emission, we want to know, is this relationship constant throughout the soil moisture uh, levels, or does it vary in uh, during uh, uh, dry period versus wet period versus in the between. So we did uh, this analysis, what we call decision tree and our methods, uh, threshold of soil moisture to CO2 emission. And this uh, analysis showed us, for example, for the chicken manure uh, double the rate biochar, that uh, it's statistically highly significant as we have seen uh, in the uh, results of the previous analysis. But if the soil moisture level is less than 3%, so this is the level of CO2 emission, is around uh, 150 plus or minus, this is the level. But if the soil moisture higher than 13.3% per volume, then you do have two cases. Either the soil moisture is higher than, still higher than 0.13%, uh, but lower than 23%, then this is the level of CO2 emission. But if it is higher than 23%, this is the level of CO2 emission. So the CO2 emission varies as a function of soil moisture level. So the drier the, 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 the soil, the lower the soil moisture, uh, the CO2 emission level, it increases, it, uh, if you increase the soil moisture, the soil moisture uh, increase and the rate of the soil of the CO2 emission is different throughout those uh, moisture, uh, uh, moisture, what you call it, uh, 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 intervals, right? Dry, medium, and high, right? Uh, we did the same thing for the dairy manure, and what you can see here is uh, we have a similar, uh, 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 similar uh, scale, but at the same time the the threshold are different here. So instead of 13%, here is 11%, and 25% here, 0.3. But also the level of the CO2 emission is different. Remember, this, the chicken manure had a higher CO2 emission than the dairy manure. The same thing, you see it here. So the scale here is up to 500. You can see here is up to 400. As well. uh, so this uh, decision tree helps us to focus uh, more into, uh, thank you, to focus more to uh, that we know the relationship between soil motion and, uh, uh, and CO2 emission, but tells us it's not, it's not uh, constant or it's not, it, it, it depends where in the soil motion uh, level you are and the rates are uh, different. So, um, you just gotta click on the screen, sorry. The, it likes the, <laughs> sorry. Uh, no, you have to, I think you have to click on the, uh, uh, on the, yeah. So, so here, here again, I mean, it's a summary of, of that relationship 
that uh, we talked about CO2 emission using uh, multi-regression analysis and also generalized additive models. You can see again, th this correlation uh, 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 between the uh, soil moisture, uh, uh, CO2 emission, I'm sorry, and uh, the soil radiation and the soil moisture and the temperature and the relative humidity. So this is the highest with chicken uh, manure, double the rate, uh, biochar uh, single rate. The same thing is the best performing is during for these two treatments. Click on the screen with the mouse. Yeah, I that'll think. be fine. That it, uh, okay, so the key findings for this uh, a part of the presentation is that the highest CO2 emission was observed uh, in the double recommended doses of, of manual application. Higher values of emission are observed uh, at the start of the growing season uh, and decreased as, as uh, the crop growing season uh, process progressed. I'm sorry, CO2 flux was strongly correlated with soil moisture. Flux decreased when soil moisture level was lower. So as you have seen, the combination of soil moisture and weather parameters improve the prediction of CO2 emission. Uh, so we would like, basically, if you know the soil moisture level, if you know the uh, temperature level, it helps you predict, especially when you are trying to model CO2 emission, it's good to have these parameters so it helps you in predicting CO2 uh, uh, emission and from uh, these type of soils. And it tells us also that uh, this generalized uh, 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 generalized uh, additive model uh, performed better than uh, multilinear regression uh, uh, model. So we're gonna talk right now about, uh, uh, talked about the CO2, right? We talked about, uh, 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 we're gonna talk right now about the crop growth parameters. Yeah, we talked the first one we talked about uh, NDVI and SPAD meter readings. So for this case, the effect of amendment on crop growth parameters. So we measured uh, uh, the plant heights. The uh, uh, also we measured the fruit uh, size, uh, etc., and sugar content, etc. So uh, for this case, uh, it shows us that, uh, and we did this. Uh, 50 days, uh, 50 okay, days to 50% tasseling for the uh, sweet corn, 50% uh, silking, cob length, cob diameter, and sugar content. And these uh, analysis shows that, for example, manure rate statistically uh, impact significantly the, uh, the milking uh, day of 50% silking. Uh, you can see it here, manure type impact the tasseling. Uh, the same thing for manure type as well here, um, and, and so on. So manure rates, almost manure rates impacted everything except the 50% uh, tasseling, days to tasseling. Uh, so uh, we did some um, uh, mean separation. Uh, this shows us the effect of amendment types and rates on days to 50% tasseling and silking. So uh, you can see that uh, from a crop production perspective, uh, the chicken manure get uh, up there earlier than uh, uh, to go to tasseling than, uh, for example, dairy manure by two and a half days or so. So still statistically, they are significant. Uh, However, you didn't see a manual rate um, effect, so it doesn't matter uh, for this particular uh, case. Uh, for the manual types and rates, uh, you can see here, uh, uh, one is, okay, this is the silking. So you can see we, what we saw on the tasseling, we saw it in the silking. Uh, we have different chicken rates are about uh, a little bit more here, and now I think it's about two days. Uh, two days earlier. Uh, however, uh, the double rate is about um, three days earlier than the other uh, treatments, okay, the ones here. So um, so this is from a practical perspective as, as, as far as uh, what's the effect on that one. 
and might not be, I mean, for, um, I don't know, for sweet corn might be uh, taken advantage of maybe early, uh, I mean, uh, what you call, higher prices, uh, if you are maybe two or three days earlier, I don't know, for maybe not for sweet corn, but for other crops can be important, having fruit available to the market earlier than uh, you can may, maybe benefit of a premium price for some uh, for some crops. I'm, I'm, I'm not an economist to tell you about the sweet corn, but uh, what I know uh, from my horticulture background is the earlier to come to the market, the, uh, you can benefit from high prices. Right, Seth, maybe you have it. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, this is the effect of amendment five star rates on the cut length and diameter. So you can see that uh, a step, there is a treatment effect for manure uh, pipes and rates. So uh, uh, chicken uh, treatments, not only they are early, but they are uh, a little longer, the cops, and their diameter is also uh, uh, wider, right? Uh, you can do some statistics on that, but they are statistically significant. The same thing for uh, uh, this is the, the best treatment. Uh, I don't know how, how it did economically, but uh, it, it gets a, a, a higher uh, diameter and a, high, and a longer coat. So it gives you a premium price for it, for especially when you know sweet corn, we sell it by the ear, right? So it, it, it's if you have a, a better quality ears, they are more, maybe you can get a premium price for that. So I'm, I'm trying to. Uh, 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 relate the applicability of this to, to the farmer because we're doing this research. It's an applied research, so it should have an end user in mind, which is basically the farmers that would benefit from this applied research. So effects from the tax rate on sugar content. Um, uh, I, I know, for example, uh, my background in, in Florida, I worked on citrus. So the citrus is sold, especially the orange juice citrus, is sold based on the bricks, which is the sugar content uh, based on, uh, and also the acidity of the citrus. So if you have a sweeter orange juice with less acidity, it sells for premium price than the other way. And one way to determine that is what we call the bricks here. So you can see that uh, for this particular case, the dairy and chicken manure, they had higher bricks uh, level than the control. And also, the, they have the same thing for uh, manure uh, type. Uh, uh, for manure type, there is no difference. Uh, yeah, both manures, they better uh, bricks level than uh, the control. For the levels or the rates, um, uh, the, the, the recommended rate or double the recommended, they have a better bricks level. And of course, uh, uh, if uh, amazing by the biochar as well. The biochar, if you have yeah. the, the biochar double the rate is uh, uh, increases the bricks level compared to the just single um, application of biochar. So applying biochar helps your quality of your uh, sweet corn uh, as well. So, um, oh, you know, in time, I'm getting there closely. So we, we did another. Uh, 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 analysis, uh, machine learning analysis using decision tree on the phosphorus and potassium level, um, uh, soil nutrient uh, as, a, as a function of the uh, cob length and uh, cob diameters. And we found out similar to the soil moisture level, if you have, it's highly significant statistically, so the level of phosphorus is less than 77.7%, then the rate of, of uh, uh, the length of, or the uh, cob length is in this range, um, uh, between uh, about 12 to uh, uh, 12, uh, I think it's six centimeters. Uh, it, if it is higher than 77, so the diameter level of the cobs are, is higher. The same thing for, uh, this is uh, for the cob diameter as well, is lower uh, if the, potassium level is less than 28% and higher than it if it is than 28% and, and at this level. So in addition to, uh, so because these um, 
uh, amendment, they bring, uh, in addition to nitrogen, they bring phosphorus, potassium, micronutrients, uh, and others uh, to, the, to, the, to the crops that you are applying for. So there is also that type of relationship between uh, crop growth and also the nutrient level in the soil. So sweet corn produced tassels and silks earlier in chicken manure uh, plots compared to dairy manure plots. Higher crop length, diameters, and ear length were observed at higher rates of manure. Uh, sugar content was significantly higher at the higher manure and biochar treatment. Uh, this work also, we had some collaboration, and this is uh, one of your Aggies. Uh, 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 this is Maria, Mariam Tanhas. She's uh, graduated with uh, Dr. Rabi Mahtar. She did some work there in our collecting some soil samples and determining the photosphere functions, uh, physical properties uh, of, of uh, soils in, in that uh, the previous treatment that we used color green before this one, but they did, she did her master's research collecting and analyzing those data and collecting this analysis there. Uh, last but not least, I'm gonna to talk to briefly about the second project. So that project is AI and agriculture, uh, establishing field research to collect data on crop nutrient water stress using multi-scale sensor and remote sensing platform, collecting, processing, and analyzing UAS uh, imagery tied to nutrient uh, content and water stress, and uh, building a hierarchical, uh, hierarchical uh, AI-based multi-scale crop water and nutrient uh, stress models, uh, disseminating this information to different stakeholders. This project just started uh, this summer, so we have preliminary analysis that I would like to share with you. Um, so we hopefully, uh, we're gonna use some sensors through drones, <coughs> through satellite, AOT uh, sensors connected to uh, AI modeling and analytical analysis like the one I showed uh, shared with you, and hopefully also using some mobile apps uh, and, and uh, the connection between them so that the end user will be using some of these uh, uh, apps to monitor some of the uh, uh, information about their crop. So uh, again, we this is the field um, uh, using our uh, drones. We weren't able to get hyperspectral imagery. We weren't able to get thermal imagery yet, but we used uh, 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 just a regular camera for uh, this growing season. And we were able to detect some uh, good results. This is two experiments side by side. So you can see, this is the experiment I'm talking about right now. This is rain fed. This is 75% uh, evapotranspiration requirement of the crop, 100% and 125. And within each treatment, we have either zero nitrogen application, have double uh, recommended rate or double recommended rate. And you can see from this imagery, is that treatment effect uh, <laughs> of the crop? And I think you can see it, right? You, you can without uh, uh, that, there is a treatment effect uh, of uh, just uh, by looking at, at, at the picture of, of, the, of this photo of the, of, the, uh, uh, of, of the field. So this is the first experiment I talked to you about. This is the second experiment. And we are using uh, uh, irrigation scheduling program to schedule because you see it's water treatment 75, 100, 125. We use irrigation scheduling software that we developed to determine when to irrigate and how much to irrigate throughout the growth season, as you can see here. It, it, uh, the crop requirements, water requirement increases at the crop growth. So this is the response of uh, uh, at one shot. And I think, uh, as you can see, it's July. <laughs> so this is rain fed treatment, 75% ET, 100% and 125%. And you can see that even the crop development is different. This one is very uh, well developed and, and flowering and, and so on. And, and you can see the control water and still uh, uh, in, in a different uh, vegetative state. Of, uh, so the data that we saw about how many days earlier uh, uh, is, is can, you can uh, see it there. 
as the CO2 emission uh, color uh, one. So this is, uh, uh, the, remember we said that we have rates uh, of nitrogen irrigation rates. So you see, this is the level of the uh, uh, nitrate level at the same time. So treatments comparing the different treatments, no fertilizer versus half recommended versus the recommended rate and the double recommended rate. So we're, we're, we're still analyzing data. We just, uh, in fact, we're still con collecting some of the data for, from the soil, et cetera, but we'll, uh, hopefully we can get some good results of this work. Uh, we did some extension outreach program because remember this is an ag, uh, this is a land grant program. You can do research, but uh, the end user is very important. So we did some, uh, uh, the field day activities. So we gave presentations about, we uh, invited uh, people who um, participate. This is uh, Dr. Robert Strong. He's um, uh, from the, uh, uh, what you call it, the Department of um, Agriculture Leadership. Thank you, Seth, for. And uh, this is one of our post postdoc doing uh, a demonstration explaining how to use the leaf area. And then uh, to the we have farmers and and, and growers and general public. Uh, so uh, uh, yeah, we we did uh, this field day. Uh, also, uh, we had another earlier field day that. Uh, uh, Dr. Kim Dooley here, uh, she's also from uh, the Ag Leadership Program, also Dr. Robert Strong, and uh, these are uh, the uh, research team uh, working there. Um, I look like a cowboy there. there too. <laughs> so uh, we also uh, go to the field fair, I mean, county fair and rodeo of Water County where uh, uh, Prairie View and is, and we connect with our the people and tell them about what we are doing there. Uh, this is an amazing field day we had at that time, as I call it, uh, student generation uh, uh, meeting. So we had our new students who are part of uh, Texas a and Prairie and University uh, uh, undergraduate student uh, summer program. We had Ag Discovery, which is our, these are middle school or high school students, and we had uh, infused program, which is a PhD uh, student from UT Austin. They uh, have been coming to um, me there in the summer. I, I teach them a course on uh, uh, water energy food nexus as a part of our infused program. Uh, so that's all of them came at that one time. That was an interesting uh, to have all these generation. So these are uh, as well the infused PV, uh, UT Austin students. Each, each year we got through the last three years, we uh, they spent three weeks uh, with us teaching them about agriculture. These are from the civil engineering department as a part of the Infuse Scholar Program. Uh, okay, so these also special learning, explaining to them. We, at the end of the summer, at the end of the summer program, we give them certificates. This is my colleague, child, uh, Charlie Worth from UT, uh, uh, Austin and uh, my colleague uh, uh, Rependra Awal, who's co PI with me, and this is uh, Erdogan Memeli, he's our associate uh, uh, director of uh, research in, in the Cooperative uh, Research uh, Center. With that, I would like to thank our uh, uh, basically funders, because without uh, their support, this research couldn't be uh, possible. And if, uh, uh, NSF uh, AgriLife uh, Research. Uh, with that, I will thank you and uh, be happy to entertain any of your questions.